believe in this democratic fact of conviviality, of companionship between disparate elements. Because if it works ethically in a film, it must work in life. If you can get things that are not the same to come together and make something provisionally whole, we have hope for life. My name is John Akomfra. I'm an artist and a filmmaker, occasional activist, sometimes writer, theorist. The title of the show is Space of Empathy. And I think the works are incredibly fixated on the idea of creating this space in which you, viewer, audience, come to meet a work. And in the process, something happens. A conversation is initiated and the conversation could lead into lots of spaces. And it's about creating understanding. It's about trying to create a place in which your affinity with other beings, other narratives, other places, other identities even, make a little bit more sense. When you browse the first room and you see Audre Lorde or Stuart Hall and Bell Hooks or Walter Benjamin, you know, these are people who have been important in my formation as a kind of porous a uh, human being, <laughs> I have soaked some of their works and ideas and propensities. So the works are infused by things. And of course, the process of migrating changes them. It's very clear when you see any of the works that there are these uh, ensemble of material, textual, calligraphic, archival, uh, photographic, you know, and, and that somehow the works are about trying to orchestrate a sort of dialogue slash conversation slash, not fight, but a sort of duel between these elements. The Unfinished Conversation centers really around the life ideas of a figure who was very important not just to me, but to my whole generation in England, growing up in the 70s and 80s. His name is Stuart Hall. The reason why he was important was, I think part of the tyranny of race growing up was the belief that it was absolute and unchanging. In fact, most racial logics insist on this. Stuart was one of the figures involved in the demolition of that idea by stressing this question of transformation and process. The final question for young colored people in Britain is the same question for young people anywhere. Who are they going to be? What are they going to be? What are their society encouraging them to be? The thing we learned from him was that identities are historically constructed. If something is constructed, then it could be taken apart. It meant that we didn't have to be as we were then colored. You could migrate from being a colored person into a black person. <laughs> a black person has agency, colored person doesn't have agency. <laughs> you know, those sorts of transformations were really, really central. The unfinished conversation therefore is about this question of how identities can be made and unmade. Vertigo Sea was made for uh, the Venice Biennial. It's the one piece that I'm most proud of because I suddenly thought, yeah, actually this encyclopedic approach where you're pulling from a range of sources and trying to force them into some sort of conversation uh, with each other has been my life and I want people to roam through it in a way in which my head is constructed. I'm a member of Chile Solidarity in the 70s. I know a little bit of African history. I know something about diasporic events. And of course, I have been deeply concerned about ecological questions since I was a child. If you make works that embody difference, have different things happening in them, the idea normally is that you're trying to collapse everything. And the opposite is the case. I am not trying to deny the validity of the Atlantic slave trade. I'm not saying the whaling industries of the 
last four centuries are the same as the Atlantic trade. I'm not collapsing things. In fact, I'm trying to point out that there's a theater of operations in which all of them take place. And because of that, they have elective affinities. It's the sea, the aquatic sublime, that offers this fiction of a unity. But, you know, they're centuries apart. They are regions apart, identities apart, species apart. <laughs> there can be differences as well as unities, you know, um, at the same time. Becoming Wind, it started at the time of the lockdown. I'm becoming obsessed with this idea that we need to find ways of modeling our lives other than the Aristotelian, <laughs> the human. One of the things I wanted to explore is how things come. In Becoming Wind, three figures, all of whom are thinking in some ways about formative moments in their lives, but it, it, actually what they're also thinking about is the coming of certain identities. The thing to come is, is what haunts most minority identities. The moment when somebody says, oh, you're the black person. It's that Fanonian moment when the thing you are hiding from finds you and names you. Becoming wind, I like that also as a metaphor for how we lived the pandemic because Many of us had comorbidities. I was concerned. And at the heart of it is this obsession with the wind. The wind has become more and more and more a kind of central figure in the projects because I like its properties. I like its personality. And I like its ethics. I like its elegance, its ability to move through things. I mean, how incredible could that be as a model for living your life? For a way of being in the world, where we try and leave as little footprint as possible. Becoming Wind is an organizing metaphor for how I've been trying to migrate the obsessions of the practice over the last 10 years. And it's probably the most explicit statement on it.